morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is J.R. Moore. We're coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks. On Wednesday, the 28th day of February, year of our Lord, 2018, welcome to the John Moore Show. We don't have any major breaking stories at the moment. The story that broke yesterday afternoon about the little envelope that was making uh, these Marines sick is, um, well, I'm not easily finding it. Hopefully we'll get some follow-up on that later. Uh, Prepper tip of the day, I want to encourage all of you to store up at least a quarter ton of iodized salt. Now, listen carefully. Human beings cannot live without salt. Uh, if you're 100 miles or more from an ocean and there's a long-term crisis, salt will become quite valuable. And uh, if you've got a, a quarter ton or more, uh, that would be a good place to be in terms of having a valuable commodity that you could sell in the future during a long-term crisis. We have a patient in the green room, my friend Professor James McKinney. Professor McKinney is a credentialed astrophysicist. He's taught astrophysics at the university level at Cornell University. He taught mathematics at Cornell University. He's an accomplished author, uh, has written 10 books with more in the way, and weekly radio talk show host. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, John. How are you today? And no complaints, sir. How about yourself? Uh, are you involved in the big flooding up there? Uh, no. Uh, the flooding has been the, the little rivers and streams that, that flood uh, all the time. And, uh, you know, nobody, there's no harm coming from this flooding. Uh, they come up and, and they flood, and about three or four hours later, they're back down. It's really not an issue, Jim. Oh, okay, okay. John, I don't know if it's in the studio, but I'm getting a lot of mic rustling noise. I don't know. Anyway, it's coming into my feed here. So okay. Uh, anyway, right. um, uh, yeah, on your comment about salt, I want people to understand that sea salt. When you buy sea salt in the store, sometimes it does not have iodine, and especially if you buy, say, Himalayan salt or salt that may come from a mine in Colorado, and that's considered sea salt because it came from an ancient sea. But right. there's there's no iodine in there. So you have to be careful. And they, they used to uh, sell Himalayan salt with no marking. Now they actually say on packages I've seen where they say it does not contain iodine. Uh, but the other thing is uh, Morton salt, which does contain iodine, they have removed all of the valuable minerals. <laughs> That's where they make their money. So uh, Martin salt with iodine, they add the iodine into the salt after removing all of the valuable minerals that your body needs. So finding good salt is a challenge. Well, I, I wasn't aware. I thought all sea salt had iodine because it came from the ocean. That's obviously not true. No, no, it's not true. And... Morton salt, which does come from the ocean, a lot of it, uh, they add the iodine. I don't know what happens or why they have to add iodine, but uh, that's a big industry and a lot of people don't understand. So when you buy Morton salt, it's sodium chloride, and it's really bad for you because it doesn't have a good balance of minerals. And so that's why doctors tell you don't eat much salt. Well, they should they should qualify that and say don't eat much Morton salt or right, processed right. salt, right? Because uh, so, sea salt, your body would reject it if you tried to eat too much sea salt. Uh, but it's hard to get too much. Uh, but uh, uh, sea salt is uh, exactly the same as your uh, body chemistry. That's why if you get cut and you, you know, when you're a little kid and you got cut and it got some on your tongue, it tasted like salt. In fact, there's doctors who do, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, replacing blood. Instead of using blood, they use uh, a mixture of sea salt that's sterilized, a sea salt water. Right, right. No, it's not lactated ringers, is it? Is what's that? Lactated ringers, is that what we're talking about? Uh, the, the the blood the blood expander. 
Well, it, it's uh, like, say, an operation. So if you uh, need blood in an operation or something like that, or uh, there are doctors who use it as a curative method to balance people's uh, systems because they're out of whack, usually because of eating salt that is a very bad balance of minerals. Uh, in fact, on the positive side of that, there are uh, companies that sell water from, for example, the mountains of Ecuador, where the mineral balance is so good that the people live to be over 100 years old, very common, and they're out in the field when in their 90s. A lot of the, the uh, if you go into a, a house for the elderly or something like that in the United States, you look around and you can pretty much person by person find what uh, their ailments are related to food and diet only and right, exercise, right. lack of exercise. Those are the main causes in people just sit in a chair, they don't do anything or they don't use their mind enough or they're eating improperly or they eat too much salt of a bad kind. And uh, uh, so anyway, they eat too much processed food that has no food value. Well, Jim, let's get back to the salt. Now, is there my what I'm hearing there is sea salt that has iodine in it would would be the healthiest salt to consume. Is that accurate? Well, in the ocean there is iodine. There is a trace, and that is why people who live near the ocean typically get that through seafood or just the whatever is uh, grown there. They naturally get that, and of course, the way this was discovered is when the the pioneers first came, the people that lived inland were getting what they call goiter. And it was right. a disease uh, that you would get certain symptoms like in your neck, etc. And so then they discovered, well, the people over there by the ocean aren't getting it. So they then they realized it was due to iodine, which is a trace mineral, but very essential. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so regular sea salt that if you... Uh, simply processed, uh, and I've seen these operations, they are all over the world, in poor countries especially. They just have a bulldoze flat area over near the ocean, and they open up a little gate, water comes in, it evaporates, they have a bulldozer, or even by hand, they scrape up the salt, residue that's left over, and that's what they sell as sea salt. That is true sea salt. Okay. So... How do you know you're getting true sea salt that has the iodine in it? How do you know that? Um, well, if if you go to a reputable health food store and they're selling true sea salt, then you should be okay. But All it right. is difficult. It's difficult because there's a lot of unscrupulous people out there who are selling things and marking it as sea salt, and it's really not. Or, you know, it's it's difficult. So... And like I say, the Himalayan salt, which comes from a mine up in the Himalayan mountains, all this salt came from the ocean originally, you know, an ocean. But in ancient right. times, there was no iodine. Right. Uh, so anyway. Oh, really? Ancient times, there was no iodine. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, and that's the one thing I talk about in my science, that Earth's chemistry has changed many, many times. These, the salt you find in the Colorado Rocky Mountain mine is different than the Himalayan mines. Uh, the, really? the, great, the Great Lakes have no salt at all. They are purely freshwater seas, inland seas. And then you have places like the Red Sea or the Dead Sea that have super high salt content that is very different also. They're enclosed body, not connected to the main ocean. So... It's a complicated issue, but it proves that Earth's chemistry has changed radically many times. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, Jim, moving on from there, uh, what else is on your radar this morning, sir? Well, John, you know, when I'm a guest or last Friday, I hosted the Power Hour. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hosted the Power Hour. Uh, and, you know, so I'm on radio shows. I'm on your show. And I listen, unfortunately, to ads for water filters when I'm on these shows. And I call them the this, this spiffy, whissy uh, water filter commercials. And the, the issue is that 
they don't tell you, none of these places tell you that you need an add-on filter just to take out fluoride and arsenic, right. which are some of the two most common really bad things for you. And uh, what they don't tell you also is they would sell you an add-on filter to take those two out, but they cost more than the regular filter itself, and they only last for 500 gallons. So to match their claim of 2,000 gallons or whatever it is, you would have to buy four of these over the lifetime of the other filter, making the price per filter element over $200. Uh, so, it, you know, there's a... Uh, uh, plus, you know, I used to sell this stuff, and it would, at the time it was okay, but we're talking about trying to sell a modern uh, a Model T in 2018. You know, this is old, old technology. Right. And uh, it's really, you know, it's really deceptive. I mean, let's just say what it is. You know, oh, this is the best, and everybody claims it's the best. It's the gold standard or whatever, you know, they say. Right. Uh, John, I'm getting a lot of mic noise. I don't know where it's coming from. But um, uh, anyway, uh, the um, uh, so the, the issue is with these is they, like I say, they don't last long. They slow down the water flow to the point where some people don't uh, have, they can't use them with the water they have. Uh, but the problem is they don't tell people. And so people are out there drinking fluoride and arsenic thinking they're filtering their water, and they're not. It's really, anyway, I could go on and on, but uh, those are the big things. And uh, uh, just on the positive side, my water filters are all in one. You don't have to buy an extra filter to take out arsenic and fluoride. And uh, But it's, it's something that people should be aware of. And also, uh, ask where the stuff is made. Uh, there's literally no other company that makes their products in the United States. So what you're paying for is shipping, customs, double shipping again, and uh, you know the price for the product you're actually paying for is pretty minimal because it was made in a sweatshop in India or China or something where there's right. no standards on materials or, or production, etc., so anyway, our, I could go our, on. Our, clean, our cleanliness, our cleanliness. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and just one other thing, the, the black filters, uh, you have to prime them, which means you have to take a pressure hose and pump the water in backwards into the filter before you use it so that uh, because carbon is not akin to water, it doesn't, water does not naturally flow through it. And so you come, you uh, basically pollute the filter before you ever use it on the inside. And so, anyway, I, I could go on and on, believe me. But right. uh, I, I just want people to understand this because uh, when you, you hear that spiffy ad, you go, oh, gee, that sounds pretty good. Everybody really likes that one. And the reality is you got to ask these questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and your water filters, of course, are for sale at your website, which is linked on my website on my links page. Great. Right. Oh, exactly. Right. All right. All right. Uh, well, Jim, there's, there's lots of things going on uh, as far as geopolitical matters. Um, the uh, I, I thought that we'd be further along with the uh, Mueller investigation falling apart, but it hasn't fallen apart yet, has it? Well... You know, it I, it probably won't. In in fact, it'll probably they're probably going to drag it out, even into the next election. You know, it's one of those things that uh, it's it's the whole set of circumstances leading up to this, where you know the the, the attorney general recused himself the day after he was appointed, and uh, you know, leading into the opening up the door for this Pandora's box to come along. But, uh, yeah, the deep state is not going to go away. They have simply gone underground, and they're trying to to recuperate. But, uh, you know, they, they don't have any candidates. They don't have a platform. They didn't have a platform before. And uh, so it's really, you know, it actually makes for a very dangerous situation because uh we live in a one party 
it's very strange. Uh, I don't think there's any other country in the world that would call themselves a democracy and has one party that's viable. Uh, the uh, the Green Party went under with Jill, what's her name? Uh, you know, they don't really exist anymore. They were the right. closest runner up to a, you know, a third party. Uh, there's no Democratic Party at all. I mean, they're all... Uh, bound up in deep corruption. In fact, this shooting in Florida looks and smells of political assassination, not only student assassination, but it's in Debbie Wasserman Schultz region, and the sheriff was uh, uh, the guy that let all these kids get shot and his men and then takes no responsibility for it. It just all smells, you know, plus then... You know, the how the news media is jumping all over this, uh, giving it prime time attention because they had really nothing to talk about before. So this is all they can talk about now, but it's, you know, based on uh, a shooting that should have never happened. And uh, and even after it started, it should have never happened. Agreed. Uh, the more it comes out, the, 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 the higher this thing stinks, the... Uh Originally, Mr. Deputy Peterson was the only deputy that uh, didn't go inside, but it looks like there was three other deputies uh, that were in. What I read yesterday, Jim, was that uh, they were told to not go in unless their body, cam- body cameras were activated. But since they didn't have body cameras, they didn't go inside, uh, which just flies in the face of all the protocols I'm aware of. Well, it's just goofy. I mean, that's this whole thing, and, you know, the the sheriff, I heard him talking, and he sounds like some kind of weirdo nutcase. I mean, he 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 was mentioning O.J. Simpson, something about nuts and beans, and I don't know, just uh, the guy that was interviewing him was from, this, like, the mainstream media, and he, he said, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, not, nothing you're saying even makes sense. Okay. Jim, thank you. We got a break. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. It's taken three years before I could offer the inter-shelter domes for sale. During those three years, several different governments and militaries were taking all their production. The inter-shelter dome homes may be just what you've been looking for to provide affordable, energy-efficient, permanent, and attractive housing. These dome homes are prefabricated units that can be assembled in a few hours by two men with a ladder and simple hand tools. Check out the photos of these dome homes built in the Arctic, on tropical beaches, in suburban areas, and in forests. All the details, many photographs, and the pricing of the dome homes are listed on the left-hand side of my homepage at thelibertyman.com. I think you'll find these homes are not only attractive, but they're energy efficient and a bonus. You can disassemble them and reassemble them as many times as you feel you need the need to. Pretty great, huh? Something that's very, very unique. Check them out at my website at thelibertyman.com. back ladies and gentlemen we're back to Aaron Moore here on Wednesday the 28th of February my website is thelibertyman.com you'll see a banner on my website for the Hear the Watchmen conference I will be the keynote speaker Saturday the 24th if you want a discount on a ticket just go to my website get the promotion code and register using that promotion code to get $20 off the uh, conference rate if you can't attend the same promotion code will get you 20% off the live stream rate Visiting with Professor James McKinney, his website's linked to my links page at thelibertyman.com. Uh, Jim, you've got two weekly radio shows. Tell people how, how they can listen live and to the archives, if you would, please, sir. 
Yeah, thanks, John. It's every Thursday evening, the James McKenney Science Hour at the Crossroads from WWCR Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so that's 6 p.m. Thursday evening. And then I have my paid cast, which is $3.95 a month, where I go into a deep dive into scientific topics. The weekly commercial free show is uh, current events, science topics, and uh, uh, topics of interest in the science sense. And uh, the paid cast, I, right now I'm dealing with a long series on world problems, which starts with energy and water. So uh, that's all available on my webpage and how to listen. Uh, archives are there on the webpage, which is linked from your page, John. All right. All right. Um, well, I, we have our first new image of the year, Jim, posted at my website of, of a continent with new coastlines, North America this time. Uh, you're old enough that you probably, like myself, uh, was a big fan of the TV show uh, Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges. Oh, I watched that all the time. Yeah, that of was course. great. Ep uh, episode 22, season 2, the 31st of May, 1959. The image uh, appears to be a news reporter reading the evening news, and on the wall behind him is the Navy map. Uh, it's a nice, crystal clear, sharp image. Black and white, of course, because that's what they had, black and white. Um, so this project continues to move forward, Jim, with uh, these images that have been, this one, of course, was 59 years ago, 1959. Uh, your suggestion to look into older movies going back to the 40s and 30s uh, has been uh, reviewed, and we're, we're, uh, we have people doing that no, with no success so far. Uh, but at this point in time, I wouldn't be shocked by any image found at any, uh, in any decade, seeing as how the oldest one was 1952 in Look magazine, uh, finding something from the 40s is certainly a possibility, isn't it? Uh, yeah, although the, the World War II years, uh, a, not a lot of information came out. It was pretty much a dearth of, of information. But, uh, you know, the, the late 20s in the 1930s, there was a lot of activity and so, uh, in, you know, that's when Flash Gordon came out. And right. It was back right. then. So I'm, I'm, you know, suspect that somewhere hidden in there, you know, along with those early sci-fi movies, there might be something like that. Yep. I, I recall when I was a boy at my, my grandparents' home, my, I, my, my, my dad's hardcover Flash Gordon book was still in what used to be his playroom. And, uh, I, I I wouldn't even want to try to guess what the value of that thing would be now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. Oh, oh boy. Uh, Jim, we got a call and hold here. We've got Johnny B. in Missouri. Good morning, Johnny B. Hey, good morning, John. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Professor McKinney, would you entertain a question on uh, Panstar Comet? Uh, there's lots and lots of Panstar Comets. Which one is this now? This is the one that was uh, just noticed out past Uranus and ignited. Oh, the, big, the okay, yeah, the K2, I, we one. call it. Yeah, yeah, okay, K2. Could you uh, give us any kind of updates or anything on that? No, I don't if have an update. Any, I'm not, I, yeah, I'm yeah, not I, 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 other, excuse me, go ahead, finish your... Well, I was just looking for some information on it to see what the progression was, you know, if they was monitoring it, and I can't find anything. No, that that went that fell off the <laughs> that fell off the charts, and uh, I did capture the ephemeris, which is the original orbital determination, and what? so uh, we can see how that changes because it will change. It's obviously a big comet, uh, might rival Hale Bopp. Uh, it's allegedly supposed to come in only as far as the orbit of Mars, so not an Earth you know, crossing orbit or inner, inner solar system orbit, but that's the way it is now. Now, it could lose a lot of energy to where it could come in much farther. And so, like I say, I captured the ephemeris, which is all the data, orbital data, and I have that stored. So when it comes out of the closet, so to speak, someday again, then I'll have things to change or to compare. Now, just in the historical sense... When Hale-Bopp came in, when it was originally discovered in 19, 
91, four years before the official discovery, it was headed on an almost direct Earth uh, collision course. And when it finally came through the solar system, it had changed orbit so much that it missed us. Hold that thought, Jim. We got a break. We'll be right back after the break. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. We are back. Let's jump. We're back. Jerry Moore here on Wednesday, the 28th of February. My website is thelibertyman.com. That's thelibertyman.com. Lots of things there, including field training exercise, USS Liberty, December 31st, 2018. People are always asking me, and I know they've asked Professor McKinney hundreds of times, when's it going to happen? Well, I don't know, but I've got five different scenarios that you can pick and choose uh, which scenario you want to get prepared for and I give you a date people want a date to focus on well I'm giving you a date to focus on December 31st 2018 you pick your own scenario and start getting ready once December 31st uh, comes and goes we'll pick a new date and start this all over again also my website of course you'll find energy cleaners for sale this is my home business I use mine every night we focus on getting a great night's sleep we focus on Pain mitigation, it could be joint pain, arthritis pain, back pain, doesn't matter. Whatever your source of pain is, the energy cleaner will most likely help. If it doesn't, I have a 90-day money-back guarantee. When you place your order, I'm the guy that packs them up. I take them to a little country post office at Cherryville, Missouri, where they have an all-you-can-eat catfish buffet with beverage and side dishes for $8 every Friday evening. The energy cleaner is only $285, shipping included. The mattress pads that go with it, they vary in price depending on what you want. Twin, full, queen, king, California king. Everything's right there at my website where you can place your order at thelibertyman.com using PayPal. PayPal is the most secure way to make any payment online. MasterCard, Visa. You need to send a check, send a money order. My address is right there at my website at thelibertyman.com. My toll-free order line, 24 hours a day. Here it is, 800. 500- 592-9543. I say again, 800-592-9543. Taking your questions, calls, and comments here at Republic Broadcasting. The call number is 800-313-9443. Well, Johnny B., did we uh, answer your question about that comment sufficiently, sir? Well, it, <clears throat> thank you, John. It got me a little more on point. Um, may I ask another of Professor McKinney? Sure, please. Uh, Go yeah, ahead. By, the, by the way, I'm, I'm making a note uh, to follow up. I mean, I, I have so many things on my plate, um, that, uh, but that's one I do want to follow up on. Um, oh. And it, it'll probably be a while because really nothing has come out on that. <clears throat> I'm sure the, um, uh, the JPL's center where they post the ephemeris and the data, uh, which comes through the um, Smithsonian, uh, right. the, uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that and see if things change or it's, it's too early to tell. It's way out there. It just, uh, you know, but, uh, it's one of those things they clearly, uh, don't want to make a lot of noise about because this thing could become real interesting if it changes its orbit with hale Bob, the story, I mean, it, it was changing every day because of the tail right. drag. And so finally, standard science came out and said, oh, it's because it interacted with Jupiter, that it changed from a 4,200-year orbit to a 2,600-year orbit. So it had a drastic change in its orbit, and they could not explain it, so they made up this story about interacting with Jupiter, which would be a one-time small perturbation. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this one, 
given that they said it's only going to come closer to Mars, but if it loses energy, it could drop in much farther into the inner solar system. So, uh, But it's on a perpendicular orbit. I, I don't just see it as being Earth-threatening, but just to watch how it develops and how they interact with it, uh, because comets aren't supposed to do these kind of things. Uh, exactly. But anyway, they can make up any story they want. You know, an asteroid must have hit it. I, <laughs> I, 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 I could give you the laundry list of NASA excuses right now. You know, pick the one you want. And, you know, anyway. Absolutely, but uh, here's ahead. the question: Does it? Does the? Um, I assume that a lot of that, those perturbations develop from where they cross the uh, elliptical planes of the planet as it comes through, and right, of course, its ecliptic. orientation yes. on its right. Yeah, and Jupiter would have yeah. a great effect on that, would it not? Well. Uh, it's it's coming in from my understanding down below the solar system. It's not a it's it's not in the plane of the planets, and okay. so anyway, I'll have to take a closer look at it. I'll do that and just as um, I, I took a cursory look at first, there really hasn't been anything in the science news at all about this thing, so. Sure. Um, well, I, I don't uh, understand how I bumped into it. I just caught a, a note that there was a comet that ignited way out past Uranus. I was like, wait a minute, guys, that's not normal. So I put yeah. that into my repertoire of interest. Uh, appreciate the time, John and uh, okay. Professor McKinney. All uh, right. John, could I ask you about your blank, your uh, sheets that go with your health machine? Are those standard yeah. sizes? Right, they're standard sizes, so full... Okay. A twin, full, queen, king, and California king, right? Okay. Well, we have an oddball bed, so I'm going to have to go with whatever the standard size was. So that, that's cool. Appreciate okay. the time, guys. Uh, okay, thank you. Appreciate the call. The call number is 800-313-9443. Yeah, it's 9443. Okay. Um, well, the, uh, the, the wing generator, uh, Jim, any updates on the wing generator? Uh, yeah, John, so much is going on with that in the background. It's just absolutely insane. Uh, good stuff. And uh, when when things become uh, so solidified uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, things I can make public, I will do that. And some of those might be right around the corner. So, okay. But yeah, every day the this is going bananas. And so, anyway, a lot of a lot of interest, a lot of good things happening. So, uh, you know, it's it's on the road. Let's put it that way. Well, I I, I look forward to sometime soon, with no date given, to have the the genuine nickel iron alkaline batteries uh, to go along with uh, the wing generators. But uh, it's just premature to be saying we will even we're even close. There's been a lot of hurdles overcome with those. But, yeah, um, technology is yeah. especially in batteries. It's uh, is really a moving target. But um, the thing about the wing generator, um, people in uh, all over the place are really looking seriously, and in other, especially in foreign countries, of getting away from what's happened in the past. Absolutely. Uh, it's kind of ironic. I, I got just uh, three days ago, Jim, I took delivery of the uh, 1908 S Sears catalog, uh, reproduction, of course. And uh, there's uh, four or five uh, steam uh, engines that you could use to make electricity, probably 10 or 12 uh, windmills to uh, pump water with, uh, and of course, a selection of batteries. Uh, uh, <laughs> This is 110 years ago, Jim, so we've been at this a long time, haven't we? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what happened in the 20th century, uh, in my book, Atlantis to Tesla, The Colburn Connection, I talk about the 20th century as the black century. And it literally is, because Porsche had electric automobiles with, with the wheel motors that people think are a modern invention, that was all around back then. I mean, that technology was there, using magnetic wheels for brakes and putting the energy back into the batteries was all there. I mean, it was just, 
you know, uh, they were using electric trolleys and electric trains. I mean, uh, you know, the San Francisco trolley system was all right. electric. And right. under the streets back in the, was it late 1800s? I don't even know when those started. Uh, well, they, I'm, not, I'm not sure either, but uh, by 1936, uh, uh, we had pretty much everything we've got now in some form or another. There was television, there was coast-to-coast -coast, uh, air, air airplane travel, uh, speed of light communications with both telegraph and telephone uh, all, all over the world, by the, uh, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, those first uh, three decades, uh, three and a half decades of the 20th century, were phenomenal, weren't they? Yeah, and if, if we could go back in time, that's an interesting point. If we could go back in time to where China had a population of 350 million and India had a population of 350 million and kept the British out of there, who basically drove those into poverty so that they were basically that's associated with the population growth. I mean, imagine the world with, with uh, two billion less people <clears throat> and the proper use of technology and the proper uh, gardening of this planet and its natural resources and eliminate World War I and World War II. Just imagine where this planet would be right now. We'd be out beyond we'd have human beings in space stations out beyond Pluto. Uh, you know, we would have, uh, you know, food for everybody. We would have a very good lifestyle on this planet. We would not have mega cities with all the corruption and, you know, uh, everything that goes with it. If you could stop back at that point, you know, the 30s uh, into the 40s, etc. So... Uh, just incredible, and it should be an electric world, an electric, uh, electrically run world, and with energy that's not coming from burning coal and now nuclear and other forms of what I call high energy content fuels. We dig them up out of the ground, uh, convert them into a form that then can be burned, and 80% of that goes up as heat energy that's totally lost. So when you use, uh, I have a little video on the top of my homepage, uh, or I guess I put it down at the bottom now. But anyway, it's it's a, about a two and a half minute video, and it's a coal train going one way, and an empty coal train coming back it was a. Uh, we're out in I don't know if it was Colorado or Nebraska somewhere out there, but a Wyoming coal train, and it, these trains are like eight miles long, and they go day and night. There's two sets of tracks, so one is coming back while the other one is going out. It just, you know, burning this much coal is insane. It's absolutely insane. And then to understand that 80% of that goes up as heat energy and, and does not get converted into electricity. So when you see a, a 2 billion uh, watt, a 2 gigawatt power plant from coal, um, it's five times that amount of energy has to be burned in the coal to get that. So, you know, it's insane. This is, you know, we just can't keep doing this. And you look at countries like Africa or now South Africa has a water shortage. These are curable problems. They, they shouldn't have existed in the first place. But, uh, you know, when you look at CNN or MSNBC or mainstream media, nobody even touches this. It's all Trump and Russia and Syria and and uh, healthcare and and North Korea. It's just the stories that uh, you know the the uh, the poster uh, stories that they pick to just keep pounding on that have really no relevance in the world. Yeah, well, that, that's true, and and they, if it, anything that has is connected to uh, death or sex, will get the headlines immediately on it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I saw where Mueller. This is so so strange. Mueller had dropped the charges against Gates, and remember, it was Gates who they got the FISA warrant against to open the door, the Pandora's box, to all of the the. Um, investigation into Trump 
And so now they've dropped the charges against him. So where does that leave this? Now they've, you know, now they're just marching down some endless road, trying to, you know, uh, you know, throwing the net out farther and farther. But the guy that originally they had the FISA warrant against, they've dropped the charges on. Amazing. Amazing. Well, something I'm working on, the reason I got that Sears catalog, I'm trying to, to locate uh, equipment that was about a century old, where barns were, uh, farm, farm, farm barns, uh, were illuminated by electricity that came out of the sky. And I've, I've mentioned it to several people, if they ever driven past a barn that had lightning rods on the roof that had uh, glass bulbs at the bottom, insulators, and Almost everybody's seen those. They're beautiful. Uh, usually it'd be a green or, or, or blue glass at the bottom of the lightning rod. Then I go on to tell them, you know, lightning rods don't have insulators uh, because that would obviously not work. <laughs> but uh, what you're seeing on these barns, what looks like a lightning rod with a glass bulb at the bottom, is a way to collect electricity from the sky, from the air, and make use of it inside the barn. Um, so far, my research has not come up with any results, Jim, but I'm, I'm uh, going to move forward with this project and ask my listeners to help me also. To uh, What I want to do is get back to find the original manufacturers and possibly patent uh, information as well uh, for these devices. Have you ever heard of these yourself? Uh, uh, John, my understanding, and I was bound around a lot of barns when I was a kid, is that those bulbs, if there was a lightning strike that could potentially compromise the electric circuit to ground, that bulb would break if there was a lightning strike. And so it was an indicator that if you saw the bulb broken, that that lightning rod had done its job and potentially could be uh, damaged. And so you had to go inspect it. That well, was what I understood about those. That's certainly a possibility also. And we need, we need to look into this more. we got a caller on hold here. we got Dan in Missouri. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, gentlemen. I hate to bring it up again, but it's this bears on my mind heavy. Could you? Uh, I'm sure you're keeping an eye on Fukushima. Can you bring us up to date and uh, just paint a black picture for us? I can't see it any other color than that. Well, yeah, nothing is being done. The, the government of Japan has not done anything. There's certainly a lot of graft and corruption where they're throwing a lot of money at it, but there's, they're not doing anything. So they, they're talking about a trillion dollars uh, potentially that it's costing them, but, you know, what are they doing? They're not doing anything. Uh, so, uh, Well, the media you know, is sure not talking about it, that's for sure. No, no, there's, it's not on the footprint. It's not, uh, you know, it's not anywhere to be seen. It just ignored. So uh, I'm trying to get count, uh, like whale count information, because now is the Pacific whale season, uh, where they before they move up into like the northern waters, and uh, it's hard to get real information. There's nobody doing counts. There's nobody, you know. Uh, yeah, there's literally nothing being done. Like a place like Scripps. Uh, research center out in La Jolla not doing hold anything that, hold that thought Jim we've got a break we'll be right back And we're back. There are more here on Tuesday, Wednesday, the 28th. Visiting Professor James McCanny's website is linked on my links page at thelibertyman.com. We are our last caller on hold here. We got Rick in Missouri. Good morning, Rick. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, John. Good morning, Professor. Um, so I'm at the uh, 
corner of Market and 7th, and I can see about the first 200 feet of the arch, and that's it because I'm in a cloud. Uh, and speaking of being in a cloud, um, I know exactly this electrical project you were talking about. I know what you're talking about. I was told that that was something that Tesla was involved in at one point. I told um, this lunatic that I know about this, and he gave me some armature wire. He had a spool of like two miles of copper wire. I'm going to say it was like 18 gauge. I strung about 2,000 feet of it out through the trees. Uh, no small task. But I was only able to collect about one volt DC. And I, I'm not finished with this yet because I've been told it's possible, but dang if I know how. But I am very interested in it. Well, uh, Jim, do you have any follow up on that? I got my own if you don't. Hello, Jim. Is Jim there? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, can you hear me? Okay. There we go. I can now. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the vertical electric field is about uh, anywhere from 100 to 300 volts per meter vertically. So going horizontal will not do much for you. No. Oh. But oh. going vertical, uh, you got to be careful because all you're going to do is induce a lightning bolt down your wire someday, and Ben Franklin would hmm. advise you don't do that. Uh, so okay. uh, this is don't play around with this stuff. You're not going to get much energy from the atmosphere because the entire atmosphere is a dielectric, and uh, it's a it's an insulator. It's going to stop any current from flowing to your location. And so what Tesla was doing was drilling a hole through the dielectric. He was doing it electrically with his Wardenclyffe Tower and uh, his uh, Colorado. Uh, experiments were similar, but it takes a lot of energy to do that. And once you do, once you drill all the way through, you're going to get this tremendous yeah. uh, influx of energy from the upper ionosphere. And it's going well, to I... uh, be a tremendous surge, which uh, no equipment that you can build is going to be able to handle. So anyway, well, I would be real careful uh, dragging wires around and, and especially hooking it to something. <laughs> It's very dangerous. Well, I threw it over the high tension line just to get some height. Um, I think you're. Are you just oh, saying this so that I build a wing well, generator? Don't do that. Like, you're just well, trying to get me. He's to, cutting. Uh, yeah. He's, he's uh, cutting. Yeah. I well, Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. I. Um, I've got your book. I guess I'll just stick with that. But it was a thought. Well, I've been. I'm enjoying the show this, uh, this morning, gentlemen. Thanks a million. Okay. Thank you, uh, okay. Jim. We got Jim. We got about sixty seconds here to to wrap this up, sir. Yeah, I've, I've determined that using what Tesla was doing for generating electricity, that is tapping the vertical electric field, is a very bad idea. Uh, I've determined that wind is the cleanest source of energy. It's worldwide. It's very controllable, very predictable, and it's the best source of energy. All right. Jim, thanks for having back next week. Appreciate it. Top the hour break. We'll be back. Stay tuned. More here, our second hour on Wednesday, the 28th of February. Your prep for tip of the day. I want to encourage all of you to stock up on uh, iodized sea salt. Uh, a quarter ton would be good. That's 500 pounds, 10, 50 pound bags. Relatively cheap right now. Bugs won't bother it. Heat won't bother it. Cold won't bother it. For the time being, thieves aren't going to want to steal it. Uh, but in the future, it could be incredibly valuable if you're 100 or more miles away from an ocean. So that's your prepper tip of the day. We have Patient Wayne in the green room, my friend Jeff Nyquist. Jeff was a gentleman who took the time and made the effort beginning more than 20 years ago to become quite knowledgeable of the true threat posed by international communism. And uh, good morning, Jeff Nyquist. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you with us, sir. Uh, if you would, please, give people your website. Yes, it's uh, J-R-N-Y-Q-U-I-S-T dot com. J-R-N-Y-Q-U-I-S-T dot com. And it's linked on my link page. Um, Jim, the, uh, uh, Jeff, excuse me, <laughs> Jeff, the, uh, uh, 
public discourse concerning uh, Russia uh, and uh, President Obama, Russia and President Trump, uh, Russia and the uh, 2016 election continues to go go in different, uh, unpredictable uh, and bizarre directions, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've been doing a, a project with a Romanian researcher uh, in the last uh, couple weeks, and uh, we have uh, been looking at the refugee crisis in Europe, and we have found evidence that the Russians are behind it. Uh, in fact, uh, some very significant public figures in Eastern Europe have stated that the Russians are behind it, that the Russian uh, mafias were involved in the transportation of refugees, that the PKK, which is a terrorist organization in Turkey that the Russians have used, are, were involved in the transportation in, in, in Turkey. Um, there's also the, uh, the Russian carpet bombing of towns and villages in Syria that set large numbers of people in motion towards Europe. But people from all kinds of different countries uh, were moving there. And uh, our analysis is uh, tending towards an understanding now uh, about why this, and it is connected to this business of, you know, Trump is a Russian puppet. Uh, it is the reason that there's, an in, there's a reversal going on, and, and that reversal has to do with breaking up NATO, believe it or not, because um, the Russians, they will, they're trying to get the right to come to power in Europe. But it's a very different right than the right we know here. It's, uh, it's a right that is amenable to socialism. It is a right... That is uh, that might some part of it look back to Nazi Germany or or to Mussolini. That is a right that's anti-American. It is a right that is uh, is going to be invited to Moscow. Um, and uh, we had Mr. Wilders, uh, the champion of that right and of freedom, by the way, in Holland, went to Moscow here recently to make Russia its ally against the, the Muslims, the terrorists, and the refugees to solve the problem. It's very interesting to see how the right in Europe turns to Moscow, and it's very interesting to see how Mr. Trump is being attacked here. And it seems that Hillary Clinton was supposed to win the election. And if Hillary Clinton had won the election as expected... She could call the right in Europe deplorables and drive them into Putin's arms, you see, even all the faster. But she didn't make it. So their right. plan got thrown into disarray. So they have to attack Mr. Trump in this extreme way. It's very interesting. Um, and, of course, the reason is, if the left comes to power in America and the right is in power in Europe, then NATO can't continue because if they make that divide strong, stronger than steel, it will break Europe. It will break These, it from America. It, yeah. Well, and that's the goal, is, is to break the uh, connection between Europe and the United States, uh, militarily, politically, economically, and, and culturally, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, NATO's the biggest strategic obstacle that Russia has ever faced. And destroying it is, is objective number one. Um, and, and this, you know, it, it, it's even been, it, it was even suggested by some of these people in Eastern Europe that that's what the objective is, that they are, they are trying to drive a wedge uh, between America and Europe. Of course, we have this politically correct president you know, Mr. Barack Obama, right? He has an Arab name. He looks like an African. And you have Arabs and Africans pouring into Europe. And, of course, the Europeans are saying, you know, the Americans, this is the, what the Russians did. The Americans are doing this to us. The Americans caused it because the Americans didn't solve the problem in Syria. And, and they only have to point to what Hillary Clinton did in Benghazi, right, helping to give weapons to the rebels in Syria, so that therefore their 
The Americans are to blame for the refugee crisis, not the Russians. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, well, it's all it's all being played out, and it's all carefully orchestrated, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a remarkable thing um, to see the strategy. Um, and, of course, a lot of people, uh, they can't see the strategy. But it's important. We have to see the strategy and what the Russians are doing. Um, and it's very, it's very strange, too, to see the left in the United States pose as anti-Russian. This is so strange, so very strange, because... These are the people that were crying McCarthyism. Every time somebody mentioned Russia or the Soviet Union or communism, and yet they're the ones doing it now, and they're pointing at a conservative president, Mr. Trump. So they are. Is, they are. Uh, well, they're using, you know, Donald Trump is a businessman. He's he's been working at the international level for more than two decades. Uh, in in his business, uh, borders are pretty meaningless. Uh, in his business, uh, the motivation is to uh, uh, run businesses, uh, uh, provide services and products people need, uh, and make a reasonable profit on those products and services, whether they're golf courses or hotels or whatever they may be. And at that level, of course, you're going to interact with the people who run other countries, uh, not not only Russians, but people who run many countries, uh, you know, England, Canada, Mexico, Britain, France, Germany, and so forth. So interacting with foreign nationals at the highest level is just the way it's done when you conduct business at that level, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah, it, it, it is. And, of course, businessmen are vulnerable. Uh, it's been known for years. In fact, uh, President Trump mentioned this. He He's well informed on this. If you travel to Russia, you have to be careful. Because when you go to Russia, the secret police are looking to blackmail you. They have uh, microphones in hotels. They have prostitutes they've hired. They try to compromise you in any way they can. And, of course, uh, anybody who's got any lick of sense goes to Russia. They have to be very careful. And then, in fact, when this phony Trump dossier came out, Trump made a statement like that. He said, oh, you know, I'm not stupid. I know how that works in Russia. I know how they try to compromise you. You think I'd do something like this? You know, besides being a germaphobe, which he pointed out, there are quite a few absurdities in the Trump dossier, and that's why it's such a scandal that it was used to get a FISA warrant, because it's so right. palpably phony. Right, um, right. But it, that's, it, it's interesting. It is well, it quite is. A and, and I mentioned first hour. I, I was hoping at this point in time that the, the Mueller investigation would have fallen apart. It hasn't yet. They're, they're scrambling to find anything they can find on anybody even remotely connected with the Trump organization, the Trump campaign, aren't they? Yeah, it is quite desperate. I mean, the indictment of the 13 trolls, Russian trolls, sight unseen, they're never going to be put on trial in America. They're in Russia. It's, uh, it's, you said it last week on the show. You said they were playing to the media, the, the, the Mueller team. They're just playing right. to the media. Right. Yeah. Well, they are. They are, and they continue yeah. to. Uh, well, Jeff, I've been conducting, uh, I've been involved in trial preparation going back to 1972, and very complex uh, legal matters, uh, federal and otherwise. And uh, given the resources of the FBI, which are, for all intents and purposes, unlimited, uh, any good investigative team could have found whatever needed to be found in no more than two or three months at the most with the power of subpoena uh, that they've got. Uh, of course, they could find, if there was anything to be found, they would have found it in no more than 90 days. Uh, I know I would have given those kinds of resources, uh, but the fact that they didn't tells me all I need to know, doesn't it, you, Jeff? Yeah, sure. They would have, if, they, if there was something on Trump, they would have had him by now. I mean, this is a long time. You're right. This is a long, long time. And then to have an indictment of people that not only are unrelated to the campaign, 
but they're really unrelated to influence in Russia. And this is what some people have to understand. What, what the, those trolls were doing is, you know, Russian trolls right now as we speak are pretending to be Nazis. They're pretending to be Republicans. They're re- pretending to be Democrats. They're pretending to be every conceivable thing because that's how they target different groups. They pretend to think like those groups do. They get on the Internet, they buddy up with them, and then they give them their poison. They pass along poisonous disinformation to influence that group. They, didn't, they weren't putting Trump ads on the Internet to get Trump elected. Thirteen trolls in a troll farm in Russia aren't going to get Trump elected. They're trying to insert toxic ideas into Trump followers, into people who, who believe in Trump. That's all. It's disinformation. It's the the typical Russian strategy. It's psychological warfare. But it wasn't to get Trump elected. And it's so ignorant for people to claim that. Um, You know, so I'm I'm seeing all kinds of very ignorant articles written by Democrats, by people who hate Mr. Trump, about Russian espionage. I mean, it's... No. (laughs) You know, it's, uh, I, I, I read one about Maskarovka the other day. Uh, uh, it, it came out yesterday, I think. Um, and this article, Maskarovka is a battlefield intelligence term, meaning, meaning basically concealment and deception methods on the battlefield. And they're applying it to the troll farm, right, Maskarovka. No, you know, they, they misapply these terms. No, that, that was a disinformation psychological warfare operation attempting to influence different groups on the Internet. You know, they also tried to, they did, they said pro-Hillary Clinton things in order to plant poison on that side of the political divide. So uh, the, the total misrepresentation and misunderstanding of these issues uh, is rife throughout. It is. It is, and they play on people's ignorance, they play on emotion. A lot of what we're seeing in uh, national news and national discourse is pure emotion. Uh, the uh, Florida shooting, uh, much, of what, much of the discourse taking place there uh, on, all, on both sides is emotion-driven uh, with uh, a large lack of facts, a large lack of logic, um, and... Um, it's a shame to see major decisions being made by Fortune 500 companies, by governments, by elected officials, uh, based on fear and based on emotion, isn't it, Jeff? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's about the gun control issue and in, in the school shootings. I remember being shocked 20 years ago, well, 19, 18 years ago, almost almost 19 years ago, When the Russian general staff held a press conference in Moscow, and one of the major issues on the table it wanted to talk about was gun control in the United States, how the United States needed gun control. Now, I scratched my head and I thought, why is the Russian general staff talking about gun control in the United States? And, of course, the answer should be obvious to any American, because if there's a nuclear war and they are going to occupy us, they don't want us to own any guns. Uh, and Jeff, Jeff uh, you're, uh, I agree with you absolutely. Um, I was suggesting earlier this week that we need to make sure liberals don't watch any episode of um, a TV show that was hugely popular in the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, titled The Rifleman, starring, starring Chuck Connors. Did you ever happen to watch that when you were a boy? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, they're all they're all on YouTube. It's more than a hundred episodes, but the first fifteen seconds uh, of every show, the introductory first fifteen seconds of every show, they begin with Chuck Connors uh, holding a uh, hundred and thirty year old lever action rifle and shooting it thirteen times in about eight or nine seconds. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, the liberals uh, publicly state their fear of uh, centerfire rifles that can fire rapidly. Well, the point being, a 130-year-old uh, 
lever action rifle can shoot every bit as fast as an AR-15. Uh, granted, you do need to reload it, um, but uh, that's not a big deal. Pushing fresh cartridges into the uh, magazine. Uh, so we need to make sure that the liberals don't see the first 15 seconds of any episode of the Rifleman, so they won't want to ban 130-year-old uh, lever-action rifles, which, by the way, as far as the law is concerned, aren't even firearms. Uh, they have no legal status as firearms. They can be bought and sold just like bubblegum. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and because they're... Because they were made before 1898. Any farm manufactured before 1898 has the same legal status as a pack of bubble gum. Uh, here's our break. The call number is 800 313 Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. It's taken three years before I could offer the inter-shelter domes for sale. During those three years, several different governments and militaries were taking all their production. The inter-shelter dome homes may be just what you've been looking for to provide affordable, energy-efficient, permanent, and attractive housing. These dome homes are prefabricated units that can be assembled in a few hours by two men with a ladder and simple hand tools. Check out the photos of these dome homes built in the Arctic on tropical beaches, in suburban areas, and in forests. All the details, many photographs, and the pricing of the dome homes are listed on the left-hand side of my homepage at thelibertyman.com. I think you'll find these homes are not only attractive, but they're energy efficient and a bonus. You can disassemble them and reassemble them as many times as you feel you need the need to. Pretty great, huh? Something that's very, very unique. Check them out at my website at thelibertyman.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. J.R. Moore here on Wednesday, the 28th of February. My website is thelibertyman.com. That's where you'll find the banner for the Hear the Watchman conference. I will be the keynote speaker. If you want the discount, uh, get the promotion code off that banner at my website for the Hear the Watchman conference in Dallas in March. Okay, uh, we're visiting with Jeff Nyquist. His website is jrnyquist.com. There is a uh, link on my links page at thelibertyman.com. Uh, Jim, uh, your being on my show has generated uh, a lo- very large, very positive response. People are are just itching to hear what you hear, what you say each week, and um, uh, I want to encourage people to go to your website and also to buy your books and read your books, uh, uh, which are available at, at Amazon.com, aren't they, sir? Yes, you can get my books. There's quite a few. I've co-authored three. I've, I've written three by myself. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is only available in Polish, believe it or not. Really? Um, because yeah, because they're the people in this in this in the world that understand some of these issues better than anyone are in Poland. Um, and the and you know when you look at what Anton Anton Mazarevich, uh, the former defense minister of Poland. Uh, he, uh, he, he had Anatoly Galitsyn's New Lies for Old translated into Polish. Good for him. And, uh, back about ten years ago, yes, he did. And, of course, there was a change in government and they destroyed all the copies. Oh, um, really? The, the, <laughs> yes, the pro-Russian Polish government destroyed. Because what had happened back then was that they had discovered that the Russians were using Polish, their spies were in Polish military intelligence, and they were using them in, in, in order to uh, manipulate the different political parties in Poland, and they discovered it 
They started outing these spies. And, and this is, you know, the story of how Poland is broken free more than any other Eastern European country. Um, is an astonishing story, but it's not told. The U.S. press is never going to tell the story of, of Anton Mazarevich or any of the, the, uh, the you know, the, the downing of the Polish plane with the president of Poland killed going to Katyn Forest in, uh, uh, this, was, this was back in, in 2010. What, what was uh, the purpose the, of the Katyn Forest visit, if you know, sir? Yeah, it, it was to commemorate that that was the, the 70th anniversary of the massacre by the Soviet Union of the Polish military officers. I think it was about 30,000 killed there and buried in shallow graves. And uh, the, the president of Poland's plane was flying there, and, you know, the, the, the evidence in Poland that the, that's got everybody talking is that there was uh, ammunition residue found on the wreckage on the wing of, wings of the plane, of the down plane, which means that the plane was brought down by an aircraft fire. Right. Right. Which is well, astonishing. The, well, if, at the end of World War II, the uh, Russians were blaming the, the, the German army for that massacre, in which the German army uh, veterans all were denying that. And the truth finally came out that it was actually the communist Russians who murdered all the, uh, the Polish off, uh, military officers. Yes, yes. The Germans discovered the mass graves, I think, in 1943, if I remember, during the war when that part of Russia was occupied by the German army, and they brought the Red Cross in because they wanted an independent verification that they hadn't done it. They wanted to make that clear. Um, you know, the Germans committed atrocities during the war, the, the, but this atrocity was, was extraordinary. It was horrific. And, of course, the Polish government knew. The Polish government in exile in London knew perfectly well that the Russians had done this. And, uh, and it was... It was it was shocking the way the British government attempted to side with the Soviets on that issue back then, and uh, and you know they they even had to, to you know Mr. Churchill had to be confronted by his own cabinet and said no, our our allies did this. I mean, yeah, you, you, you think you've allied with somebody and you find out how how evil they are, and it's like a shock. Well, that that brings to mind something that the. Uh the North Vietnamese were shocked and surprised that American soldiers, quote-unquote, would never surrender, no matter how desperate they were, no matter how shot up they were, uh, which, uh, in the case of the Russian officers, uh, that's hindsight, obviously, but they never should have surrendered. Uh, we got a caller on hold here, uh, Jeff. we got uh, Paul in New Jersey. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, don't you think... NATO extending up to the Russian border is provocative. And don't you think, you know, you're provoking Russia by moving American bases? And I, and I urge your listeners to look up the amount of American bases, military bases, posted throughout the world versus the amount of Russian military bases posted throughout the world. You could see that the West and NATO, you know, and who's to... Uh, you talk about a nation that's a troublemaking, uh, menacing nation that's destroyed a lot of the world. Look at the United States. Look what they've done to Iraq and Libya. You know, so really, we're on no moral footing to talk about anything about or point the finger at the Russians, who really hold are being thought, backed Paul, into a corner a by America. Paul, Paul, hold that thought. we got a break. We'll be right back. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. We're continuing our energy cleaner promotion, which began August of 2016. In this promotion, you get to buy an energy cleaner, $70 off retail, and a mattress pad, 10% off retail. $200 of the purchase price of the energy cleaner goes to Republic Broadcasting. This is a great way to help get energy cleaners out to people who need them and have some uh, financial issues to deal with. And, of course, a great way to support Republic Broadcasting. Here's what you do. Send in a postcard. My address is John Moore, P.O. Box 201, Davidsville, Missouri. We pick a postcard every two weeks. If your postcard is drawn... 
uh, you get the chance to buy the energy cleaner seven dollars off retail and ten percent off the mattress pads. Put your name and your address, your telephone number, and your email address on the postcard, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. All right, we are back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back here or more here on Wednesday, the 28th of February. My website is thelibertyman.com. That's thelibertyman.com. There's lots there. Uh, free downloads, books which have uh, the copyrights expired and so forth uh, that you can educate you and inform you. Uh, check out the free download section at my website for all the different publications that are there. You may want to check out the Artificially Sweetened Times. Uh, it gives some Great information on the harm caused by all artificial sweeteners. Uh, great education. Also, of course, my website are energy cleaners. This is my home business. When you place your order, my order taker takes it on the, on the, my order line. They forward it to me by email. I'm the guy that boxes up your energy cleaner and your mattress pad, and I ship it to you, priority mail, from the little country post office at Cherryville, where I am the largest shipper there. <laughs> and... By far and away the largest international shipper, by the way. Uh, only $285 shipping included to American zip codes. If you have arthritis pain, joint pain, back pain, get yourself an energy cleaner. What are you waiting for? Seriously, what are you waiting for? I offer a 90-day money-back guarantee just to make sure that you have a level of confidence that the energy cleaner will work. If it doesn't, there's a tiny percentage that it won't work. Uh, I offer a 90-day money-back guarantee. Uh, be sure and check out the factory-made fitted mattress pads that go with the energy cleaner. Twin, full, queen, king, California king, the handy travel size. It's a great combination. Most people these days are getting both at, at the get-go. So you can place your order uh, at my website at thelibertyman.com using PayPal, MasterCard, Visa. You can send me a check or money order if you need to. My address is at my website at thelibertyman.com. My toll-free order line, 24 hours a day. Here it is, 800-592-592. 9543. I say again, 800 592 9543. Visiting with Jeff Nyquist. Uh, Jeff, you heard uh, Paul's comments uh, basically uh, giving information that the United States, uh, our hands are not clean when it comes to conducting uh, foreign policy that is harmful to people and harmful to countries. Your response, Jeff? Well, we were talking about Russian trolls before. Well, that's the kind of poison that Russian trolls put out so that this man, I'm not saying he was a Russian troll, but he was influenced by one. Um, yeah, I mean, why, if he's pro if you're for your own country, of course we don't want a Eli massacre. We don't want uh, our country to do these things. And, uh, and no country is perfect. No person is perfect. I mean, I didn't get on this program and say we're perfect. You know, he jumps into this moral argument, we're perfect and Russia isn't. Uh, no, I, I'm not saying that. Russia poses a threat to our country. We, we don't want to die. We don't want to be taken over by the Russians. Uh, and we don't want to take over the Russians. You know, I'm not preaching to destroy Russia. I, I, I'm, you know, my whole thing is, is that we should defend ourselves and our allies. Look, uh, I mean, if you study the order of battle, he talked about bases in NATO. Look, the Baltic countries, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, were horribly pr- oppressed. By the Russians. Poland has been horribly oppressed. And he talks about all the NATO military bases. And you know how weak those countries are? Poland has something like 15 combat brigades. I think there's only, only four or five that are deployed at any one time. They're not a threat to Russia. The United States has a combat brigade in the, in the Baltics or, or in Poland at one time. That's not a threat to Russia. One brigade. Russia is a country that has a hundred standing divisions at any one time. A brigade on its border, a few brigades on its border, is not a threat to a country that size with nuclear weapons. Well, Those Ch- countries Jeff, joined Jeff, NATO because sum- they wanted to. Yeah. Let me summarize y- yeah. your, your, your message compared to Paul's thoughts. Your message is the threat posed by Russia, while at the same time you're not holding up the United States and our foreign policy 
as the glowing uh, light and city on the hill that has not done no harm. Your message is the threat posed by Russia as opposed to uh, holding up the United States as the uh, the best and highest standard that can do no harm. Would that be somewhat accurate? Yeah, that, that would be accurate. I mean, okay. I, I, I'm not, you know, like I said last week, and it might have been the same caller, you know, I did not uh, support, you know, I did not, I support the president and the military, but I was not in favor of invading Iraq, and I, I, I didn't oppose the invasion of Iraq, because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was immoral to invade Iraq. Overthrowing a dictator like that and 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 freeing oppressed people is moral. I didn't think it was right for America's interests to invade it. I thought it was doing something that we would get stuck with. Um, well, and and we did, and uh, I was against it from the get go because uh, the, the whole premise was flawed. Uh, uh, can Paul, I make a point? Yeah, make, yeah. Make I'd like to make a point. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, if if the Russians are such a threat, and they could have attacked Estonia, Lithuania, and uh, other countries in the vicinity, the small weak ones, why didn't they do it already? It's been twenty some odd years, and they haven't set foot they in any. They did it in nineteen. Listen, they did attack those countries in nineteen forty. They attacked. Them. No, no, that's not true because that would be the Soviet Union. That would not be Russia. Okay, this is a modern Russia more liberated, tolerated from the yoke of uh, Soviet communism, right? And well, I you think need to, you need to do your provoking homework. them by backing them into a corner, as we're doing, okay. by extending NATO and putting it right along the borders. By the way, I'm not the only one who says this. I'm in, I agree with Mr. Pat Buchanan, who has discussed this issue very well. And we are clearly, if you're going to talk about it, a vulgar imperial nation wrecking nations around the world, Take a look in the mirror. It's the okay. United States. And we're ignoring okay. what our founder, George Washington, had said as we engage in these foreign entanglements. And I hope, uh, sir, Mr. Nyquist, that you get on board with that line of thinking. And stop okay. trying to promote this Russophobic, you know, demonization of what I would say is one of the last decent white nations on Earth. Okay. Paul, thank All you right. for your call. We appreciate it. Um, uh, okay. Let me jump in here, Jeff. Uh, I have no doubt that Paul believes what he says. Uh, Paul, you, I know you're listening. You need to do your homework. Uh, the Soviet Union did not spontaneously collapse. The uh, Eastern European countries did not spontaneously collapse because a bunch of 20-year-olds went to their, sta their capitals and jumped up and down and said, we want rock and roll and blue jeans and democracy. No, it was all orchestrated. It was all orchestrated. It had been orchestrated. You need, Paul, you need to read the book. New Lies for Old, written by Anatoly Galitsyn, who was part of planning what you believe is true. What you believe is true, Paul, is a fabrication, a fabrication that was planned uh, decades in advance to give the appearance that what you believe, Paul, to be true, what Pat, Pat Buchanan believes to be true, is in fact a fabricated lie. The communists never gave up control. The communists gave the appearance of giving up control so they could achieve their goals into the future. Go ahead, Jeff, your response. Yes, exactly right, uh, John. The, the, this is the hardest thing to get people to understand. I mean, I've even talked to Patrick Buchanan years ago about this, um, uh, and he, he, de he doesn't get it, and a lot of conservatives don't. The Russians... Look, uh, Mr. Putin gave a speech before 30,000 communist youth last October, and he said, we are with you, we're 100% behind you, you are the bright future of the world. Uh, this uh, Vladimir Putin has two acts. One is the real Vladimir Putin, and the other is the Vladimir Putin that, uh, that pretends to be a Christian, that wears a cross, that, uh, that pretends to be a nationalist. You got to understand. You got to look at what Russia has done in the, especially the last ten years. Russia is engaged in an unprecedented arms buildup. They're producing fifth generation weapons. We're not producing fifth generation weapons. They're renewing. They've renewed their nuclear arsenal. Our nuclear arsenal is obsolete. You, you, you got to understand. We have have allowed ourselves to disarm to a degree that our weakness now. When you combine Russia with China, and they are allied together. They're part of that old communist bloc, 
and you combine them with the communists here in the United States and the Democratic Party and some that are in the Republican Party, when you combine that, the threat of communism has never been greater than it is now. And you need to talk to people who are suffering in Nicaragua, who are supported by the, that communist government, they're supported by Russia. And the people in Brazil who have who freed themselves from Delmo Rosas and the, and the Workers' Party that the Russians were supporting, and the people in South Africa who are being oppressed, the white farmers who are being killed. You kill, talk about white people? That is a Russian-backed African National Congress is a Russian-backed communist-run party. And the Congo, where the communists have taken over Russian supplies, Chinese supplies, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, taking that over. The Russians never stopped supporting communism abroad. They That's never true. stopped. That's true. Yeah. Well, the communists are basically colonizing Central Africa. They're building roads. Uh, hydroelectric uh, schools, uh, hospitals, airports, bridges, dams. Uh, they're colonizing Central Africa uh, as we speak. Uh, we got a caller on hold here. We got John in Texas. Good morning, John. Hello, sir. Mr. Nyquist, good morning. Uh, I have a question. Where were you during 19, 1982 and 1991 from the death of Brezhnev? to uh, December 26, 2000, I mean, 1991, when the uh, Union Treaty was formally dissolved. And what were, and what were you observing at the time, and what, what did it kind of seem to you at the time? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. There's a slight modulation. You said something. Where were I? Be, where was I between 1982 and 1991? Right. Where were you? What were you doing? And what what was the, your impression of what was going on at the time that the that uh, the so the uh, so called perestroika and glasnost was going on? The eventual so, so, so alleged breakup well, breakup of the Soviet Union was going on. What was I doing? And what, 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 were, what, were, what were you doing? See, what were you doing? I mean, what what uh, were you? Yeah, what, what, what well, were you I doing? At the time, I was, I was when Gorbachev came along, I was, uh, I had just, I was entering graduate school just after that happened, and I was studying, you know, I was studying to be a political scientist. I was working on a Ph.D., and um, I was discovering communism, how active it was underground in the university, and how it was, uh, <clears throat> it was uh, gaining a, positions and it was uh, changing people's careers it was helping its own and destroying people who weren't its own <clears throat> and um, I got interested in the subject because of that and I, I studied the Soviet Union I, I studied uh, um, the defector literature and in 1987 I made a discovery I discovered that there were more than one defector there were two defectors and it's only Galitsyn and uh, Jan Shana, who both said there was a plan to fake the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, and that that plan would be used to disarm the West and uh, and cause the West to believe that Russia had been taken over by democratic reformers, and that that would cause the West to start to neglect its defenses, which it has done. Okay. Mm. So... Mm, I just so when the uh, so it, it just it, you you at the time you saw it you saw the whole thing as a strategic deception while it was going on. Well, I had this moment. I you know when it started, <clears throat> I I I didn't see it. It was only when I read this defector literature that it suddenly struck me, because I was interacting with other graduate students who were going to go into the CIA. They were going into the Rand Corporation and other think tanks, and I was listening to what they were saying, and I was, I was a little troubled by the naivete. And then when I read this, I, you know, when I, I first read Galitzin when it came out in 1984, and I thought, well, that's interesting strategic ideas, but they could never do such a deception, especially because this book has been published. This book would blow it open. Any, any of these things start to happen in real life, Nobody's, everybody's going to go, oh, that Galitzin guy, that defector, he told everybody that it was going to happen, and, and so that's what this is. It's a fake collapse. 
Well, I was naive because I didn't understand how naive other political scientists were when I first read the book. But when I was in graduate school and I met them and I saw the influence of the left and I saw the political correctness beginning to form at that time, I, it, it suddenly struck me, they are going to do it. In 1987, I believed they were going to collapse the Soviet Union on purpose. I believed Galitsyn's predictions were going to come true. So I had that advantage of believing it ahead of time and then following it closely as it occurred and noticing the stagecraft, noticing how it was crafted, how it was created, and then all of the voices in Eastern Europe who were warning us, the other voices, warning us that it was happening. Um, you know, there's, there's just, there's so much. I mean, uh, do you ever heard of Andre Kadrescu who wrote the book The Hole in the Flag? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have heard of that book? Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a Romanian who, who pointed out that the overthrow of Ceausescu was accomplished by the Russians, not by the Romanian people. Ceausescu was Very the only one that was, that was murdered. Ceausescu didn't get the memo that this was supposed to happen. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Ceausescu didn't want to give up power. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. He ended up being murdered in his attempt to maintain power. Uh, John, thank you for the call. we got our last break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I thought break. I heard music. Well, not a break. I'm sorry. Uh, Jeff, i got to follow up on, on your comments. Uh, one of my heroes, yeah. David Hackworth, wrote a book titled About Face, and uh, – he was when he was getting uh, interested in going to Vietnam because he was an officer in the U.S. Army. He went to the Pentagon Library. Uh, they only had about three books that were pertinent to Indochina. At the time, they had paper tags to indicate who had checked them out in the dates. And he found out that it, they, these books in the Pentagon Library had been checked out three times. And um, oh. so we're preparing to go to war, and the Pentagon the Library. Uh, nobody had even bothered to check out the only three books, except for maybe three or four officers, uh, as we're preparing to go to war. Uh, he found that very alarming, as, as did I. How about you, sir? Yes, I find it alarming. I, I lecture before different groups, and I remember years ago I, I lectured before a group of retired intelligence officers. I think there were 40 or 50 men in the room. Some of them were generals. And I asked the person who introduced me, who was a colonel, he asked how many of them had read Galitzin, and only one person raised their hand. That is scary. Painful. Yeah. That is painfully scary. Here's our last break. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. Let's jump. We're back. J.R. Moore here on Wednesday, the 28th of February, visiting with Jeff Nyquist. His website's jrnyquist.com. Uh, Jeff, we've got about uh, three and a half minutes or so here. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, the, the information on, on, on Eastern Europe, uh, by the way, from Poland, from Romania, from Czechia. There's, I, I wanted to mention Robert Bukhar's film um, uh, about the collapse of Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, it, it is a, a documentary. Now I'm flipping on the on the title, but people should uh, should Google it. They should look for this film. They should buy this film. It's he interviews former title Czech title please title please police. Yes, now I'm. I'm blanking on it. Robert Bukhar, B-U-C-H-A-R. Um, it's called... Um, <clears throat> ah, the trouble with getting up in the morning, and I even had my coffee, and it's it, <laughs> not helping me, but it didn't. It doesn't come. Anyway, it's a trouble. It's a senior moment, but but um, he interviews... Uh, if people uh, Google Robert Bukhar, B-U-C-H-A-R, they will... Um, he wrote, 
he wrote a book also on this title, which is he interviewed uh, people formerly with the secret police in Czechoslovakia about how the revolution, the Velvet Revolution, was ordered from Moscow. Um, you know, you you go to country after country in Eastern Europe, and you see the truth. Look at in Ukraine in 2014. Velvet, Velvet, were, hang- oh, Velvet yeah. Hangover. Velvet Hangover. The, that's, um, a, that's a movie. He did. Yeah. Future, feature Velvet released, Hangover. Yeah. Feature, well, that was link. that was that's not actually the movie I'm referring to. That's a different one. Oh, okay. Um, uh, the Sorry. Velvet Hangover was uh, is about the uh, um, the movie business in a uh, post communist. Uh, Here, here's West. another documentary: the collapse of communism, the untold story. That's it. Okay. That's that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah, no, it's in. People need to see it because they they'd be able to see uh, all kinds of defectors. They'd be able to see all these people, and. Um, and they'd be able to see it here it themselves about how this was done from Russia. Absolutely. Well, uh, I, I haven't seen this myself, but it's, it's, as of today, it's on my list. Uh, probably both uh, of these documentaries, actually. Um, and um, uh, I look forward to seeing them myself. I thank you for the heads up there, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important that, that, you know, our... Our press does not do us justice, does not get this information to us. Uh, I was going to say, in 2014, there were hundreds of statues of Stalin and Lenin uh, pulled down in Ukraine. They were supposed to have had an anti-communist revolution back in 1991 in Ukraine. What what were all these hundreds of statues of Lenin doing that they had to pull them down in 2013 and 2014? And you can go online and you can watch the videos of, of people pulling up with pickup trucks, tying ropes around these statues and knocking them down. Back in 2014, they were all over the Internet that these young Czechs did. So if there was a communist revolution in, in 1991, how come there are all these Lenin statues all over the country? Why don't we talk about that next week, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, thank, you for being, thank you for being with us. We look forward to having you back next week. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, great show. Uh, in the meantime, get your medical supplies, your energy cleaner, your essential oils. Now, while you can, your firearms and ammunition, never, ever give up your guns. Have a wonderful, safe, productive day, and God bless America. <laughs>